Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today we are once again celebrating the life and career of the fabulous Doris Day. Our guest can easily be called her number one fan. He's an accomplished theatre performer with starring roles in Little Shop of Horrors, Forever Plaid, and Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. He's also a recording artist and has appeared in numerous TV shows. For the past few years, he's been touring the country with his award-winning one-man show celebrating the incredible Doris Day called Doris and Me, One Man's Obsession with Doris Day. And most recently, he's released his latest CD entitled The Doris Day Project, containing 16 of her greatest hits. And if that weren't enough, he's also just released a double DVD tribute to Doris Day's life and career entitled Forever Doris. And all of the proceeds go to the Doris Day Animal Foundation. I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome the wonderful Scott Dreyer to our show. Scotty, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Harvey, I am so honored and humbled to be a part of your sensational show. And I'm just I'm so touched you asked. Scott, you truly are Doris Day's number one fan. Can you take us back to when you first fell in love with her? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I come from a family, a uh, uh, kind of religious family. And so as a kid, I, I wasn't really allowed to watch TV or movies or listen to music until I was about in junior high school. But once a week, my mom would let me watch something on Saturdays with her. It was called the Saturday Afternoon Film Festival. And it was hosted by an extraordinary man, Tom Hatton. He was a sort of Turner Classic Movies before Turner Classic Movies. And he showed a lot of Doris Day movies. And so she kind of was my entire pop culture as a kid until I, until I got a little older. But I remember the first time I saw her, it, it never felt like I was watching a movie or watching an actor perform. It just, it, I just knew that the real Doris Day was always shining through in everything that she did. And so she always felt like a friend or a mom. And so as a kid, I just connected with that. And she, she just represented so much to me early on and, and obviously continues to today. There was nobody like her. For me, when I think of Doris Day, it's all about her amazing voice. Are you able to put into words what it is that makes her voice so special? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously there's the famous story about that she was going to be a dancer and she was in an accident and her leg was shattered. And so while she was recuperating, uh, she started taking voice lessons from a wonderful woman, Grace Rain. And I think it's, it's Grace's advice to her that is the reason that no, to me, no one sings a, a love song like Doris Day. She said, always sing a song, a love song, as though you're singing it to one person and to only one person, and to a very special person, and that you're singing it in their ear. And I think that's why when I experienced Doris Day, just like her movies, she feels like she's singing just to me, only to me. And I think that's what makes her, her. and then of course, she's just an extraordinary vocalist. I have to tell you, Scotty, that when I watch Doris's movies or interviews or listen to her singing, I actually think she had a kind of a healing energy about her. I couldn't agree more. I. I think she was the best reactor actor that was ever, that ever hit the Hollywood scene. She really listened and she really took it in. And, and even if, if it were a, a comedy and, you know, she's famous for doing her oohs and, you know, all of that, it was always filled with real reaction. And so I think because of that, we go through the journey with her and we root for her and we want her to be okay. And, and then there's just this thing. She was so centered as an artist that, that immediately makes you, I mean, I always say whenever I'm having a, a bad day or, or things that are hard in my life, she is, I go to Doris Dayland and, and she takes me away. I mean, she had that ability and she continues to have that ability for me and so many others. I know you've met Doris several times. Can you tell us about those experiences of meeting her? Sure. So I met her the first time in 1993, and I, I talk about this in, in my show, Doris and Me, but I, I was just a little too young to, to kind of be able to really say to her what I, what I needed and wanted to say to her. And, and she was amazing and extraordinary and 
she spoke only, uh, I was with a friend and she spoke only to us for 45 minutes. I mean, just, just so pr a presence that you just don't encounter, you know, often in life. But I, I left that moment going, darn it. I didn't, I didn't really get to tell her what I, I, I needed to tell her. And so I got a redo, gosh, almost 20 years later, in 2014, uh, the Doris Day Animal Foundation was throwing a big, big party for Doris to celebrate what we thought would be her 90th birthday and found out later it was her 92nd birthday. You know, there's always an, an age discrepancy with Doris. And she made her first public appearance in over two decades that night. And wow, I'll never, ever be able to explain to, to anyone that wasn't in the room the night that night. She wasn't introduced. She just walked in the room and it was like the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan. I mean, the place went insane. And everybody sort of raced to the table. And, and I just thought, no, this isn't, this isn't how I'm going to have my redo with her. I, I had three people that night that were sort of going to make sure that I got my moment with her. And, but then the, the, one of the reasons that she is Doris Day is they had this whole program. And at the end of the program, someone came up to her and said, Doris, you know, we're going to sneak you out. And that beautiful human being said, oh no, all these people have come so far to me. I can't leave until I've met every single one. And at 92 years old, she greeted over 250 people for over three hours. And so, I mean, it's just insane. And so when I got my moment with her, I, I was very emotional, like burst into tears. And I was like, Scott Dreyer, you have waited 20 years for this, this, this do-over, you know, suck it up. Just that I just had, I've been waiting, you know, for so long to be able to tell her. And so I, I grabbed her hands in mine and I said, Miss Day, in, in a human's life, one person can make a difference. And to me, you are that person. And there have been many, many times during the course of my life where you have saved me. And she, of course, in typical Doris Day, uh, Mode said, saved you, you know, how, how could I save you? And I told her it's through your artistry and your music and your humanity and your kindness to animals. You just, you inspire the course of my life and you make me want to be a better human every single day. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And she grabbed my hand tightly and she looked me in the eyes and she said, oh, Scotty, those are the sweetest words and I'll treasure them always. And they say, Doris Day moment I will never forget. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah. Do you know how lucky you are to have gotten the opportunity to speak with her and tell her how you felt about what she's meant to you in your life? Yeah. It's, it, none of it is, is wasted on me. I, I, it's funny, when I started doing my, my show, Doris and Me, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I knew that people loved Doris Day, but, but I, I built in my show, I greet fans after, or not fans, the audience after, after each show. And I began to discover just how beloved she is. And then when I went to Carmel and I met so many fans that, that feel the same way that I do, it really shows who she was. And the, I just don't think there's any other star in Hollywood that had that connection with her fans. She really saw her fans. I feel grateful because I, at the time, I thought that was going to be you know, that was going to be my second time seeing her and, it, and, it, and meeting her. And it was, but I feel even more grateful that there were, there was a third and a fourth and a fifth. And I got, I got some wonderful time with her. And, and the thing I, I could say about her is every single time I was with her, anything I could imagine her to be in my mind, she was so much more. I understand your favorite Doris Day movie is The Thrill of It All. Why? I love all of her movies, but it's the first movie that I saw of her. So it's my first memory uh, seeing, imagining her falling in a, a bucket of tomatoes. But when I watch that movie specifically, I just think it's, it's the right combination of everything. It's, it's the writing is brilliant. Of course, the direction is, is Norman Jewison. You don't get better than that. I think her chemistry with James Garner is sensational. And it's, it's like a masterclass in comedy. I mean, just watching the Happy Soap commercials alone 
you just see her, it's, it's that reaction, that natural reaction. And I feel I'll share with you one of the, the times I, I got to spend with Doris. When I would get time with Doris, I always was able to tell her the impact that she had on my life. And she was always so present and she always really heard that and received it and, and was so present for it. But I remember one time uh, just asked, just saying to her, to me, nobody reacted like, like you. you. Your reaction acting is, is a masterclass. And she just kind of took that in for a moment. And she said, Scotty, I'm, I really worked hard at that to, to make it feel natural and to make it be natural. And I loved having that like actor to actor moment and, and, and realizing, I mean, I think the, the thing that's deceptive about Doris is because she did everything and made it look easy, it doesn't mean that it was easy, right? I mean, she, she could dance, she could sing, she could do, you know, that's why they called her the Fred Astaire of comedy. I mean, she, you know, James Garner said it didn't matter if it was Rock Hudson or me, she made us all look better because we just, you know, we all went, that's better, let's do that. And they went on that beautiful ride. But I think the thrill of it all for me uh, is definitely just because she really, to me, connected as a mom. Like I felt this mom, I felt this friend um, and this accessibility. So I think, I think I love all of her movies. Of course, Love Me or Leave Me is her, you know, wonderful, greatest dramatic performance. But, but all of her movies just, I'm beginning, I'm watching them all right now in chronological order. That is what a Doris Day nerd I am. <laughs> so I've been starting at the beginning and working my way uh, through the end. But I just, I love visiting every single one of those glorious 39 pictures. Do you have a favorite Doris Day song? It changes a lot for me, but I, I, I usually always answer to that sentimental journey because it's, it's the beginning. It's the very beginning. And you just, you hear her with that band. And I imagine her in those band days and, and just the connection that she had with her fans, even then. And, and knowing the importance of that song, right? That it, it just resonated with so many servicemen and, and it just it catapulted her. So there's something about that that I, I absolutely love, but, but I, I fall in love with every single one of her songs. I don't, I don't think there's one that I don't absolutely love. Norman Jewison said that the most important aspect of Doris's acting was believability. Do you agree? 100%. Just having the honor of getting to uh, interview that extraordinary human and exquisite director, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's, that's the key, right? That's the key to anything. If you're watching a movie and you believe what the people are saying, it, it, it takes you away. And Doris always did that. And I think the key ingredient to that was that she always was showing us a piece of who she was and everything she did. And so we went on the journey because we were worried for her or we were excited for her. But uh, to me, the most believable of actors. Scotty, I know you agree with me that Doris Day was very underappreciated in Hollywood. She never got the respect and acknowledgement for her talent that she deserved within the industry. For example, she never won an Oscar. Why do you think that is? You know, I, I know that they offered her honorary Oscars, but it was always under the condition that she, you know, come in person and accept the Oscar. And I just think you know, this is speculation and I always hate, hate to do that, but I know that her life became about animal welfare activism. That's what was important to her. And I think she appreciated awards. I mean, there is proof of her saying that, but I, I don't think that they were everything to her. I think, it, I think her work with animals was the most important thing and, and her connection, I think the award to her was hearing from so many fans after so many decades that they just were so touched and moved by her, her artistry. Um, I, on a personal level, I wish that they would think that they could still write that wrong. I, my idea has always been that they should create a special award for her and have her be the first actor ever honored with both the acting uh, honorary Oscar and the humanitarian. Uh, I just, not to diminish anyone, anyone else, but, but each year, as I see, especially the humanitarian Oscar, I just think no one did what Doris Day did. I mean, for animals 
and, and so much earlier than anyone else. It, it, it just seems like a shame that they, they've never honored her. And a good year to do it would be this next year because it would have been her 100th birthday. So if anybody's listening from the Academy, please, please. <laughs> Did it frustrate you as a fan that Doris walked away from show business in the prime of her life and really took no interest in her career once she walked away? You know, I feel like that, that's a great question. Uh, you know, there are always the what ifs. I would have loved to have seen the, the projects that, you know, she was supposed to do but didn't, whether it's South Pacific or The Graduate or uh, Murder, She Wrote, or all, all these things, are, especially the movie Mother. I think she would have been incredible in that, the, the Alfred Brooks uh, movie. But, you know, I think the thing that I, I love about Doris is, you know, she always said she didn't retire. She just decided to do something else. And I am such a huge animal lover and animal welfare activist myself that, that I understand that sometimes our purposes in life change or alter. And, and when I think of what she's done for animals and, and what she continues to do with her legacy, as much as I would have loved to, to see her artistry continue, I also think that the, that's, that's the biggest thing she ever did and she helped so many four leggers. But you know, Scotty, there are other entertainers like Betty White and Bob Barker who were animal activists all the way through but never stopped performing. I think the answer is she didn't love it that much. We see so many entertainers who just keep going long after their expiry date. They just won't stop. And yet, with Doris, she couldn't have loved doing it that much because she was able to walk away from it and really not have any interest in it at all. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's honestly less about that and, and just in my brain because she, she did it for so long. I mean, you know, she did it during her, you know, was traveling with a band early on. And when she wasn't making a movie, she was making a record. She was always, it was her, it was her life 24 seven. And I think once she finished the series and finished her, her last special, I think, you know, she was, she enjoyed, she used to talk about, you know, that she loved going to Safeway. She loved doing her own shopping. She, you know, things that she never had time for when she was in the studio system and when she was making movies. So I, I think that she was just kind of, you know, how some people are, don't have childhoods and they make up for it later. I, I think for her that she was enjoying living and she was enjoying her life. And, and then of course, later she did do her, her cable series, uh, Doris Day's Best Friends, and, and really was able to combine being on camera with, with her, her animal welfare work. So I think it's, you know, to me, I just think she began to really, really enjoy her life. And, and when you go to Carmel and you see her beautiful home, it's like, I think I would have left Hollywood too. It was a oasis up there, right? Before we talk about the new CD, The Doris Day Project, I want our viewers to know that your debut CD entitled Scott Dreyer is just wonderful. It's an eclectic mix of standards, show tunes, pop songs, really showcases your terrific voice. I just love it, Scotty, and I'm so glad you did it. And I hope everybody goes out and gets it. Thank you so much. That was, I feel like... Uh, I'm going to sound a little Pollyanna or a little Doris Day like myself, but I, I feel so grateful for every opportunity that I've had in my life. And that, that first CD was so special and I wasn't sure you know, how much recording I would do. And so I wanted it to be really eclectic and I wanted it to cover everything from standards to big band, of course, always recording a couple of Doris Day songs at least. And then even, even musical theater, I wanted to uh, really really embrace all of it. So that was thrilling to get to make that, that first album. Okay, now on to the CD, The Doris Day Project. I know this was a labor of love, but it must have been quite a daunting task to undertake a tribute album to your favorite entertainer of all time. Yeah, it, it was. You know, it's, it's interesting. I actually took advice from Doris that she has said over the years is, is to not try to imitate a singer, but to find your own way with a song. And I think I really tried, tried to do that. That was, I wanted to honor my own interpretations, 
But I also, in the same way, when I listen to Doris, there are moments I can hear Ella Fitzgerald because of course I, you can tell she loved Ella Fitzgerald. I've been influenced by Doris Day my whole life. I've listened to her music. I listened to almost only Doris Day music. And so for me, it was about always capturing the spirit of, of how the song was recorded, but, but finding a runway. Like a, a great example is the duet that I do with the incredible, extraordinary Jane Monheit, Everybody Loves a Lover. That song, Doris's version, feels fun and sexy and light and happy and joyous. And so we just decided we were going to give up, you know, our version kind of a New Orleans feel. But, but my kind of challenge to myself is I wanted to make sure that the song still made me feel all of those same things. And the only song that I wanted to just truly honor Doris and do exactly as it was intended is Sentimental Journey. I, Les Brown Jr. was so incredibly gracious to, uh, I called him and I just said, there is no better arrangement than your dad's. And he said, uh, do my dad's arrangement. And he, within five minutes, sent me the arrangement. And so to me, it, it also, I wanted that to end the album. So everything else, we kind of try to find our own way and honor Doris. But that last song, I wanted to go back to the beginning and I wanted to do it just as she did it. I want to mention the duet with Jane Monheit, Everybody Loves a Lover, has all of the proceeds going to the Doris Day Animal Foundation. I want people to know that. How did you choose the songs? You know, I, a lot of them were songs that I've been singing in uh, my show, Doris and Me. I, I, I had a lot of worry about that. You know, when I, I come from a family, uh, my mom worries a lot. And so I come, I come from that naturally. I want to, you know, people pleaser. I want to make sure I cover all the great hits. But ultimately, when I, when I started to create my show, Doris and Me, and then the Doris Day Project, uh, of course, we wanted to include her greatest hits, right? That was important, you know, because everybody wants to hear It's Magic and Secret Love and Que Sera and, and Sentimental Journey, all of those songs, which, of course, I love. But I also wanted to visit some of her lesser known songs and, and songs that have really stayed with me over the years. And I, I just I think with art, as long as you love the songs, that comes through when you're recording. So I just I wanted to really, really just pick a really great mixture of her, of her most famous songs. Aside from the beautiful songs and your wonderful voice, which I've been listening to all morning, by the way, I have to tell you that I really like the CD because of the liner notes and the booklet. This is what we used to get before everything went digital. And I love that you produced a whole package. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I did crowdfunding for that album. It had, I had been stuck by, by doing, making the album and someone suggested crowdfunding and it is, it's an awfully hard thing for a people pleaser to ask for anything. I am the king of doing favors. So I had to sort of get past that and then remember that that's, that's how things are made these days, right? It, we don't have big record labels and, and then sort of changing my way of thinking of, wait, you're just asking for people to buy the album before you make the album. And so when we had such an overwhelming amount of support to making the, the album, I wanted to really, really make it special. And I am old school. I am like you. I like to hold a CD or an album in my hands. I love to be able to read the liner notes. And so we wanted, we just took such time and care. And uh, I had the extraordinary uh, Jeffrey Smith, who a dear, dear friend of mine, helped with the, with the design element. And I just... I'm really, really proud of it. It, was, it took a village for sure to, to make that album, but I'm, I'm so proud of it and I'm so grateful it's in the world. So am I, and I hope every Doris Day fan gets that CD because it's uh, an, uh, an absolute must. Okay, Scotty, let's talk about the double DVD set entitled yeah. Forever Doris, which you produced. I absolutely love it. I mm -hmm. highly recommend it to every Doris Day fan. And again, all proceeds go to the Doris Day Animal Foundation. Tell us what it was like to put this amazing tribute together. Well, you know, I, I made a DVD before Forever Doris called Celebrating Doris. And kind of the, the entire idea happened quickly in a nutshell. I had, it was after meeting Doris the second time at her, her 90th slash 92nd birthday party. 
I did my first run of Doris and Me in Los Angeles. And a lot of the wonderful fans that I met during that time were all going to fly in for the show. And because I was so touched by that support by these beautiful humans that I had connected with in Carmel, that I thought, gosh, I want to, our opening night is going to be benefiting the Doris Day Animal Foundation. Let's, let me get a, uh, try to find my way to some of Doris's co-stars and we can have a little, a little red carpet. So I immediately contacted uh, Jackie Joseph, who is a, uh, just the most extraordinary human. And I just is like a, like a second mom to me. I love her so much. And she agreed to come. She was on the Doris Day show, of course, and agreed to introduce me that night. And then I found my way to five of Doris's other co-stars. And we made a little video that night on the red carpet. And I had a friend of mine interview uh, each person as they were coming in. And then two very dear friends of mine got that video up to Doris for her to see. And she loved it. She was just, first of all, she was so touched that, you know, her co-stars were there to help raise money for her animal foundation. But it, it kind of lit an idea in me, I thought, you know, there are so many wonderful documentaries and, and things out there celebrating Doris, but there, there really wasn't something that interviewed all of her co-stars. And I thought, I want, I want to create that. And, and what if I create it and, and I can get everyone to, to donate their time and their talents and, and then we can have truly all of the proceeds uh, benefit the Doris Day Animal Foundation. So the first one was, was celebrating Doris and I interviewed 15 of her co-stars and then I wanted, I really wanted to, to do kind of a part two. And so we did some of those interviews uh, while Doris was still with us. And then truthfully, I got stuck after she passed away. I, I felt sad and depressed and a little paralyzed by it. And then I could hear, I could hear her. I think one of the memories that I have of Doris that stays with me more than, than any memory and it, and it drives me and it, and it helped me continue the DVD. I remember one time saying to her, you know, we'd raised a lot of money for one of her birthday events and she was clapping and she was so happy. And I said, well, Doris, we, we do this because of you. And her, it's one of the only times I ever saw her, her get upset, her eyes filled with tears. And she looked at me and she said, oh, Scotty, I don't think I've done enough. And I thought, 97 years old, and you haven't done enough. And it just reminded me that I still had work to do. And the best way to honor her would be continue the DVD and to finish these interviews and to create something really special. And especially with the pandemic and not getting to really celebrate her life the way that, that we had intended to with events. Um, it was a way to sort of honor her in a DVD. It was thrilling, uh, especially working with my, my main editor, Michael Hadley. He is a huge Doris Day fan and a dear, dear friend. And we really just, we spent at least a month on every single interview, just really painstakingly going through and making sure that we honored Doris. Of course, we honored her legacy for animal welfare but that we really, really honored these humans that so graciously and kindly shared their stories and their love of Doris. And so this became such a labor of love and at times very stressful and especially during a pandemic. I mean, some of the interviews we're doing, you know, outside during a pandemic with the elements, but the driving force for me was I kept hearing Doris Day say, Scotty, help the babies, we have work to do. So. That, that was the thing that, that led me to the conclusion. And I'm so grateful it's out in the world and, and raising money for the babies. The DVDs are filled with stories and tributes from Doris's co-stars, friends and fans, including Norman Jewison, Mamie Van Doren, Robert Wagner, Rich Little, Lonnie Anderson, and so many more. And you interviewed them all, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, the, some of the footage of the Robert Wagner and uh, Lonnie Anderson, uh, dear Jim Pearson got footage for us uh, doing other projects. He was able to, to interview and kind of ask my questions. So we got, we got the footage that way, but everyone else, I was in the room or, or remote for some of them because of the pandemic. But yeah, I got to be with, with each of them. And, and what an incredible thing that everyone has that same memory. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing is not only are you 
catapulted back in time with each of these movies and you feel like you're on the set with all these co-stars, but then that every single person has this same collective memory of her kindness, her generosity, her beautiful spirit. It's, it was a lovely thing to behold and to get to share with all my fellow fans. One of my favorite parts of the DVDs is the tour you did of Doris's house. What an incredibly magical home she had. It, there is no place on earth like it. And I'm so grateful to the foundation for allowing me to go up. We, I did that during the pandemic. It's, and it was the most beautiful thing about it is when you got there, it, it didn't feel like any of that was going on. It, it was this, this wonderland. But the thing that, that's so beautiful about, about her home is it's just like her artistry. It's, she created a, a piece of artistry with that house. I mean, everywhere you look, you know, in every beam and every light and all the windows, it's so purposeful. And, and one of my favorite things is everywhere you look, there are kind of Dutch doors so that there are ways to sort of uh, separate dogs from other dogs. I mean, she, she always had her babies in mind and, and she just created this oasis, this wonderland on earth for her and her four-leggers. And it's, oh, it's the most beautiful place. What happened to the house? Has it been sold? Yeah, it, it was sold. And, and that, you know, at first broke my heart just because I, I in my mind, I, I imagine Doris up, up at Overlook. That's what she called the house. But then I was so happy to hear that the new owners are, are using it as a horse rehabilitation center. So that, uh, I can't imagine, you know, I, I feel like Doris Day had her hand in that. And I, I can't imagine her being happier about anything than knowing that, that animals will, will continue to be helped and loved and nurtured up there. I think it's beautiful. That is beautiful. I should mention that the Forever Doris DVDs are a follow-up to the first DVD that you mentioned called Celebrating Doris. That was released in 2016, and people can buy that online at dorisdayanimalfoundation.org. Scotty, you were very heavily involved in producing that DVD as well, weren't you? Yeah, they're both definitely ideas that I came up with, and, and I just knew that they would be so special for the fans and, and thrilling. I mean, so many of these people we've never, ever heard from about their experiences working with Doris. And it's, I think you probably feel this way with your incredible interviewing, is that mm. each of those humans became sort of you know, my, my kids, I wanted to make sure to bring out the best in them and, and you know, which was easy to do because they were all so wonderful, but to really celebrate, you know, there's only a handful of people that play Doris Day's children or that got to work with her to really celebrate their place in her history. And in each of them, I could just go on and on and on about each of those glorious humans that immediately, every single one of them, you know, when I contacted them and said, will you do this? It's for Doris, it's gonna raise money for animals. Yes, count me in. And that's what makes them so special to me. Well, the thing about the DVDs, besides the tour of her house, which I just have to look at at least once a week, mm. the thing about those DVDs that's so remarkable and special is that everyone who worked with her and knew her commented on the one quality that kept being repeated. Actually, two qualities, kindness and warmth. Everybody said that. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and that's, the, uh, to me, the reason that she is the biggest female box office star of all time. That, to me, is the reason that until she left this world, she got hundreds of, of fan letters. She just connected in that way. And then to hear from each of these co-stars the little things that she would do to make each of the kids feel comfortable and, and loved and taken care of and nurtured and, and then all of her adult uh, co-stars, the same thing, you know, just, just that, that kindness. And, you know, I think of, I'll bring up Marion Ross specifically when I, when I spoke with her about, about interviewing her, she said, well, I, you know, I, my scenes were mostly with Clark Gable and, you know, I don't know that I have a ton of, of memories of Doris. I mean, she was just so easy. She just didn't feel like a star. She just felt like a girlfriend. And I, and I said, Marion, that's, that's an interview <laughs> like it's and she was like you're right I mean but I think everybody felt that way like everyone across the board 
talked about how she never was a star. There was never attitude. There was never, you know, I'm the big, you know, number one box office star of all time. It was just this beautiful human that was creating art and, and really seeing everyone she worked with and really appreciating each person that she worked with and valuing each person. It's, it's a lovely thing. It is, and it made me see that she really was the most beloved star in Hollywood. I mean, within the industry, everybody in the industry absolutely adored her. Yeah, it's to me, it's just a wonderful thing that we are here in 2021, and Doris Day still holds the record as the biggest female box office star of all time. So those 20 years were, were mighty years, right? But I think it is really because of exactly what Norman Jewison says, that believability. People believed her and they felt for her and they went on the journey with her. And then I also think it's just that her movies continue to take us away. And a reoccurring thing that happens that a lot of fans will say is not uh, exclusive to just me is that Doris Day has saved me. She continues to get us out of hard times in our life. She always felt like a friend to me. I can always count on her to bring the sun out again if I'm having a hard, hard day or if I'm going through a particular hard time in my life. And she represents that for so many people. And the greatest thing is, is she got that. She totally understood it. And when she would receive fan letters, she she connected with the fans and she understood what, what they needed from her. And, and she was able to just really see them. And to me, being in the room with her, every time I was in the room with her, Harvey, I have never in my life experienced this. I will probably never experience it again. The way she takes you in and the way she really listens and sees you and is with you it, it just, it makes the hair on my arm stand up. It's, it was a beautiful, beautiful quality. She was, she was everything you imagine her to be, but so, so much more. She was the real deal. And Scotty, I have to say that when you watch the movies and her TV show and her interviews, and you hear everyone on the DVDs talk about how positive and optimistic she was, it's easy to forget that Doris Day's personal life was not easy. She endured many hardships in her life, didn't she? Yeah, of course. I mean, definitely she went, you know, had just terrible marriages and uh, starting from her, you know, her first marriage. And then, of course, her, her uh, marriage to Marty Melcher and uh, him embezzling her money. And she has dealt with a, a lot of heartache in her life. But I think that is another key to Doris is that she always managed to land back on her feet. She and always, she lost her son. Yeah, she lost her son too. And I know that was a, a devastating loss. They were, they were best friends. I mean, she had him so young, they were more like friends than, than uh, mother and son. Um, and I know that that loss was hard, really hard for her, must have been. But I think it's, I think it's just her optimism, her always, seeing the light and the bright in the world. And I, I think that's something I always try to take from her. And I, I try to remember that things will get better and they can get better if you, if you believe in that. And I, I think that's what I take, just the fact that she could, could survive all of that in her life and, and then continue to do such good in the world. I'll tell you what I take. Of all the interviews Doris did, there's one that really stayed with me. It was with Vicki Lawrence, of all people, from The Carol Burnett Show. Sure. And she was asked how she could be so positive and optimistic in the face of all the trouble she's had in her life. Her answer was that if you have gratitude, you can't be bitter or angry with your life. That was so profound. I've tried to follow that advice ever since she said it. Yeah, I, I, that is my life mantra. So I, we are very similar in that way, Harvey, for sure, that you always have to be grateful. And I think a great example of that is, you know, for Endorses, for her birthday in Carmel, fans would gather every single year and they would come from all over the world. I mean, as far as Germany and the UK and Ireland, just to celebrate her and honor her. And 
every year they would come. She was always so surprised. She would always get emotional. She couldn't believe people still remembered her after so many years being out of the limelight. And there was such gratitude even there. You could just see how moved and how touched she was by that. And I think, I think that never left Doris Day. And I think it certainly uh, was the key to her, her life and her succeeding anything bad that, you know, that happened in her life, her, her overcoming. Another really special interview she did was on the Merv Griffin show in 1976 when her book came out. There's a glow, a sparkle, a sincerity, an authenticity that flows out of her that really took my breath away. Yeah, I love that interview. I love it. And I love her. I just think her autobiography is one of the greatest autobiographies. And it's so candid and so frank and Again, just like her movies, it feels like she's just sitting down and telling her story and not sugarcoating it and, and just being real. Um, but yes, I love that interview. And you can see she's so comfortable with, with him. They, you know, they were good friends and you can just tell. Scotty, for the past few years before the pandemic, you were touring with your one man show, Doris and Me, One Man's Obsession with Doris Day. That must be a dream come true for you to share your love affair with Doris every night on the stage. It is my favorite thing that I've ever done live performance. It's a quick quick way it started. I was actually doing a show in San Diego and a very, very good friend of mine who was the artistic director of the theater. We were kind of sitting around and talking about our lives. And I was telling him about, you know, my pop culture just being about Doris Day early on and how I have this crazy obsession with her and you know I, I just have always loved her and he stopped me and he said Scotty that that's a show that's that's so much more interesting than watching a guy do a Sinatra show or a girl do a Doris Day show because you've been influenced by her your entire life but but of course no one's expecting you to look or sound like her and so he said you should do that show and I said great and then he he, he said the words that are uh, intimidating and exciting he said let's do it let's do it October you know whatever the date was October 14th and I thought oh my gosh I have to write a show now but it it was the impetus and I, I uh, initially workshopped the show in Palm Springs at a, another dear friend's uh, theater and I did two two kind of workshop nights at the show and just sort of figured out what the audience needed and wanted. And I, I tell my story and I tell Doris's story and I interweave her songs and then I end the show with, with the night we met. Fun, fun, quick story. After I had done the show, I decided it would be artistically more interesting if I had never met Doris Day. And so initially when I wrote the show, I didn't, didn't include that, that first part because in, you know, when I first started doing the show, I hadn't I had my redo yet of getting to see her again. And there was a very famous Hollywood producer who's produced a lot of Bradley Cooper movies that was in the house that night. And afterward, she called me aside and she said, I loved your show. I just loved it. And she said, I, I got to ask you something. Have you ever met Doris Day? And I sheepishly said, yes, once. And she said, tell me the story. And I told her the story. And she said, that's the end of your show because that's the truth. And it's always going to be more interesting than anything you, you would make up. And it was a reminder, right, to always just tell the truth. And it, and it ended up, you know, it's, it's, art is always better when you write what you know. So I was grateful for that bit of advice. And then to be doing the show, every time I would do it, people would say, oh my gosh, Doris has to see the show. Doris has to see the show. And, and my answer was always the same. I, I wrote the show to thank Doris Day. And that's enough. And, and, and to have people know about her and to introduce her to new audiences and to keep her legacy alive. That's always been my intention. And then the fact that it, it led to getting to know Doris and it, it's just all the rest of it is just it's still insane. It's insane to me, but I'm so grateful, grateful for it. So the obvious question, is there any chance that you can make a DVD of the show so that all of us can watch it over and over again? That has been honestly my, my biggest dream. I've been doing the show since uh, 2012. And I would really love to just, you know, have somebody produce it and, and I'd love to just record it and have it, have it so that people can watch it in their living rooms and, you know, especially 
people that live so far and are able to come to the show in person. That's, that's been a big, big dream of mine to be able to, to have a kind of a full circle moment and, and to get to record the show. Hello, crowdfunding. <laughs> you never know. Yes, that would be, that would be a lovely thing. I, I, I would love to be able to have it on record. You know, that's one thing as performers, we, I love, I love live performing, but when you do it, it's, it's over, right? And so I'd love to be able to have it permanently on, on record and, and out in the world celebrating her. I just, I don't want anyone to ever forget that extraordinary human. She just was so, so special. Oh, I don't think anyone will ever forget her. And I have a feeling you will put the show out on DVD. And when you do, I want you to come back and we'll talk about that. Oh, I would be honored. I'd be so honored to do that. And I, I just love this. Well, Scotty, no interview about Doris Day would be complete without talking about her animal activism and her foundation. She was really the first Hollywood celebrity to seriously take on the cause of animal rescue, wasn't she? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it really started like, I mean, just very simply, you know, just her and other actors. Uh, she first started working with other prominent actors at the time on a, with a wonderful organization called Actors and Others for Animals. And that was sort of the the very beginning of everything. You know, she, they were really, I mean, they would go, it's uh, just to talk to Jackie Joseph about it. They would hear about, you know, a dog being mistreated and they would show up at the person's home. I mean, they, they were just active and, and they made headlines because Doris Day was a star. I mean, her celebrity, she was able to really, really draw light to, to animal welfare activism in, in a way that no one else was able to because she was this extraordinary light and, uh, for animal animals. And then, of course, she started her own uh, Doris Day Animal League and her, her Doris Day Animal Foundation, uh, which continues today. And they're a grant-giving organization, and they find, they help organizations that are doing great work but that are struggling, and they provide grants for them so that they're able to do even better work. So her legacy continues and, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. She, what she created doesn't end with her passing. It just continues because everyone is inspired by that. I know that I, I certainly am. She inspires every single moment, every single curve, every single turn of my life and she always will. And supporting the Doris Day Animal Foundation really is the best way to honor her legacy, I think. Absolutely. And, and that's honestly why, why we created these uh, DVDs that uh, celebrating Doris and, and the new one forever, forever Doris, because we wanted people to be able to get to experience and celebrate Doris and, and know that when they purchase those DVDs, that a hundred percent of, of the proceeds go to her foundation. So, um, but yes, absolutely. People can, can go on and, and donate in her honor. And I think, that would make Doris happier than anything and or getting involved with local animal charities and just realizing that we can all make a difference in the lives of four leggers. I think that one of the things that helped me not be depressed when she died was that she really got how gifted she was, how talented she was and how much her fans loved her. She really got it. She had a special relationship with her fans. Yes. I, Without a doubt. I mean, she personally answered every single fan letter. I mean, that's who, who does that and who does that at 97 years old. I mean, it's, it's just, she really, like I said, that thing that I experienced in the room with her is she, she had that with each fan and, you know, she knew everyone by name and, you know, who wrote to her and, you know, who would send her gifts. And she just was so connected with her fans. And, and going back to what you so beautifully said, she was so grateful for her fans. She never took them for granted. She never thought, well, of course I have a million fans. She, they became her friends. She never called her fans fans. She always called them friends. And, and there was that, to me, I, I can't think of another celebrity that had that connection in such a profound way with so many humans, uh, two-leggers and four-leggers. I mean, she, she, nothing, nothing is like Doris Day. Well, you said it in the DVD and you've said it in this interview that one person's life can make such a profound difference in the lives of others. When you think that she touched the lives of so many millions of people who never even met her, 
and of course, what she's done to improve the lives of millions of animals for so many years, and that the foundation will keep on going, it's mind boggling that one person can change the world so much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible. But I think it, it's the wonderful thing is I think that that thing, that kindness that Doris had, we're all inspired by it. I mean, it's a beautiful thing to be with the fans because there is that, that beautiful kindness and love and friendship that immediately ha happens with each of the fans. We have this, this common thing that we love this human and magical things happen. May I tell you a quick story? It's, it's such a lovely uh, thing. So Doris would come out on her balcony and greet her fans. It was uh, something that would happen on her birthday and it was never a for sure thing. You know, each, each year we hoped that she would come out and every year she, she would come out on her balcony and the fans would gather on the golf course at the Quail Lodge and she would come out. And when it first started, it was a small group of people and she would wave and people would pass the phone around and everyone would get a moment to speak with her. Well, after she appeared at her uh, 90th slash 92nd birthday, the, the fan uh, pilgrimage grew and the, the golf course was filled with people. And, so, you know, of course, she wouldn't have been able to talk to everybody. And so at that point, I kind of jumped in and I said, why don't we have a, a lottery? Why don't we pick numbers and we'll, we'll get 10 people will be able to get a chance to talk with her. So I want to tell the story because it, it just it shows the spirit of who she is. Uh, one of our volunteers, Craig, who's such a lovely, lovely human, he said, you know, I got to talk to Doris, so maybe I won't, I won't pick a number. And I said, well, Craig, if you pick a number and you, your number is, is chosen, you can, you can give that number to anyone. And he said, oh, I never thought of it that way. And so he, he took a number and as fate would have it, the purest of heart, right? The first number I pick is his. And he immediately walks over to this beautiful woman uh, Raylene from Australia, who it was her first trip to Carmel. She had dreamed of meeting Doris Day her whole life. And he handed his ticket to her. Sorry, this will make me emotional. It's so sweet. And she said, I can't believe you're giving me your ticket. And he said, you've never gotten to talk to Doris and I want you to be able to talk to Doris. And so I had the honor of, my hand was on her back as she spoke to Doris and tears are streaming down her face. And she's getting that dream come true. And the craziest part about it, Harvey, is she wasn't sick or anything, but uh, about a month later, she passed away. And her family talked about how incredible it was that she got that moment, that dream come true. But to me, that shows that the thing that Doris passes down in her fans, that kindness, and then it became a thing at the balcony. People who had gotten a chance to speak to Doris, they began to give their numbers to everybody else and, and sort of pay it forward. So there's something about her spirit that I think encourages us, us all to be our best selves. And that comes from the beautiful light that that human just always radiated. She just, she was the best. Well, I think that somewhere she's smiling down on you for keeping her legacy alive, honoring her body of work, her philanthropy, and that amazing, beautiful spirit. In my mind, she was like an angel walking on earth. Scotty, where can our viewers get your CDs? So they're available digitally at iTunes, but if people want a physical copy, I am I'm old school that way. I like to have an actual physical copy. They can get my albums, both of my, my first and the Doris Day Project at scottdreyer.com. And I will sign them and send them out. And, uh, and the Doris Day Project, $5 goes to the Doris Day Animal Foundation. Okay, everybody, I hope you will all do that. You will not regret it. Those CDs are wonderful and they are constantly playing in my house and my car. I'm humbled by that. Scotty, it's been such a delight to have you on our show. Thank you for everything you've done and continue to do to keep Doris Day's memory and legacy alive. Your CD and DVDs are just fabulous. I can't wait to see what you come up with next, and I hope you'll come back when you do. Definitely. Harvey, you are a beautiful, beautiful human. I'm so honored 
am grateful and humbled that you had me on your show. You, uh, I love what you do. I love how you celebrate artists. You are an incredible artist yourself. And I'm so grateful for today. Thank you so much. That means so much. Thank you, Scotty. You put tears in my eyes. Our guest has been Scott Dreyer, whose Doris Day tribute CD and DVDs are an absolute must for every fan. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.